Nuclear fusion has been a pipe dream for decades. Always 20 years away, never 19. It's easy to get jaded about this technology and write it off as impossible, especially when nuclear fission already exists and is being underutilized. But by the end of this video, I hope I can change that feeling and get you as excited as I am about the potential of this technology. If we, as a civilization, actually pull it off and invent a cost-effective nuclear fusion power plant, it would change the face of society. Clean, safe fuels will allow every country in the world to benefit from this technology. Allowing countries around the world to be energy independent, preventing one of the leading causes of conflicts around the world as we fight for control of energy sources. Cheap, reliable and abundant energy is the foundation of every sci-fi utopian society. It would solve our issues with climate change, allow us to electrify industries that require fossil fuels like steel smelting, allow us to create entirely new industries that have been held back by energy costs like water desalination, providing the world with fresh clean water to irrigate our lands and turn barren wastelands to fertile pastures, ushering in an era of clean, safe abundance, a utopian future that has been dreamed of for decades. Nuclear fusion experiments have been underway since the very earliest years of the Cold War, with the first generators firing up in the 1950s in both the USA and USSR. The Soviet Union approached the problem with the tokamak design, while the Americans used a slightly different approach, the Stellarator. Each design attempts to solve the same problem. Fusion, in essence, isn't terribly complicated. We can make new elements by combining smaller elements, and in the process, release a lot of energy. However, to successfully combine elements, we need to overcome the electromagnetic repulsion, like pushing two north poles of a magnet together, atoms will repel each other. In order to force them together, we need to input a tremendous amount of energy. But we can't just grab individual atoms and force them together like magnets. Instead, we need to create a plasma, essentially a cloud of charged ions, which, thanks to their charge, can be manipulated by a magnetic field. We can then confine the plasma with a magnetic field, preventing the ions from hitting the fusion generator walls and gradually raise its temperature to extremely high temperatures that would otherwise melt every solid material in the universe. Raising the temperature of the plasma causes the ions to move faster and faster, raising the ions kinetic energy so high that their speed alone allows them to punch through the electromagnetic repulsion and collide. Both of these designs, the tokamak and stellarator, use slightly different methods of magnetic field confinement, generated by massive superconducting magnets to achieve fusion. The tokamak became the leading design today as a result of a release of information from the USSR on the tokamak design in 1968, which showed a tremendous jump in energy efficiency. However, both designs used the same fuels. The exact reactants we use have a huge effect on how much energy we need to put in and what we get out at the end. Most reactions use two isotopes of hydrogen. A regular run-of-the-mill hydrogen has one proton in its nucleus with one electron in orbit. We could perform fusion with this kind of hydrogen, but the energy we can extract out of the reaction is very low. Instead, we frequently combine deuterium and tritium together where hydrogen normally has one proton and one electron and no neutrons. Deuterium has one proton, one electron and one neutron, while tritium has one proton, one electron and two neutrons. This combination is used for a couple of reasons. First, it has the largest probability of giving us the exact result we want. Other reactions, like a regular hydrogen to hydrogen reaction, have a very high probability of creating helium-2 which is unstable and almost instantly decays into two regular hydrogens again and releases very little energy in the process. They have a lower probability of combining to form deuterium, the reaction we actually want, which then go on to fuse to form helium-3 and finally helium-4. This is the reaction chain that powers the sun, 
but the Sun has an unfathomable amount of particles, making the probability issue completely irrelevant, and the crushing gravity needed to create the conditions needed for fusion. We need to supply those particles and the energy needed to combine them ourselves, and if we can't extract more energy than we put in, that's just a science experiment, not an energy source. We have successfully created many, many fusion reactions here on Earth. In fact, I witnessed the bright pink flashes of fusion myself while visiting Helion recently. We know how to achieve fusion. The problem we are now trying to solve is lowering the energy we need to input while maximizing the energy we can extract. So, step one, we need fuels that require less energy input that release more energy. That's where deuterium and tritium come in. When combined, they have a very high probability of creating helium-4 and release, on average, 17.6 mega electron volts for each and every fusion event. For comparison, uranium-235 produces 11.4 times this energy for each fission event. But on a mass basis, that deuterium-tritium fusion reaction releases over four times as much energy as uranium fission and produces no dangerous radioactive products. Helium is actually quite a useful byproduct, being used to cool MRI machine superconducting magnets, to fill rocket tanks after their propellant has been expended to prevent them from exploding, and occasionally to make your voice sound like Wendover Productions from six years ago. Thanks, Real Engineering. Be sure to go check out and subscribe to Real Engineering's channel. And we will eventually run out of the gas, so having a way to make it ourselves would be a nice backup. Deuterium is fairly common on Earth, occurring naturally in seawater, making up about 0.02% of hydrogen in seawater. And because deuterium has an extra neutron, it makes that water molecule heavier, giving its name, heavy water. That difference allows us to separate it through a number of means. Vacuum distillation allows us to take advantage of heavy water's higher boiling point, while the girdler sulfide process separates heavy water through chemical reactions. We can then simply electrolyze the heavy water to separate the deuterium. However, one of the issues facing nuclear fusion is the rarity of tritium. Our primary source of tritium is nuclear reactor moderator pools, which are often filled with heavy water. These pools are designed to absorb the high energy neutrons given off during nuclear fusion, and in doing so, they can become tritium, a hydrogen with two neutrons. This source of tritium is becoming less prevalent as nuclear power plants are gradually being shut down around the world due to competition from cheaper forms of electricity. Currently, total global reserves of tritium are estimated at just 20 kilograms, which is not a lot considering the ITER program, the massively internationally funded fusion generator being built in France at the moment, estimates a commercial reactor will need 300 grams of tritium every day to generate 800 megawatts of electrical power, meaning we would eat through the entire global supply of tritium in just over two months. 800 megawatts is enough to cover about 2% of France's peak power consumption. Even if we could continue sourcing tritium from nuclear fusion reactors, they only produce about 100 grams per year. This is a major problem. However, we do have a solution in mind. We can use the high energy neutrons spit out from the fusion reactions to do a bit of alchemy wizardry. When those high energy neutrons encounter lithium, they can split the lithium into tritium and helium, providing a steady supply of tritium right where it's needed. This is done in what is called a blanket around the fusion chamber. The design of the blanket is one of the most challenging parts of a tokamak fusion generator. ITER will test over 180 design variants of this blanket that will line the donut-shaped interior. Because the blanket needs to do a lot more than just breed tritium. It is also where the energy of the fusion reaction gets converted to heat. 80% of the energy of a tritium-deuterium fusion reaction is carried away by those high energy neutrons in the form of kinetic energy. We need a way to convert that kinetic energy to electricity. As the fusion reaction rages in the center of the magnetically confined plasma, neutrons begin to erupt outwards, 
unaffected by the magnetic field thanks to their neutral magnetic charge. Tokamaks convert the energy of these tiny particles by slowing them down in the blanket, trading their kinetic energy with atoms in the blanket to heat energy. This heat energy is then captured by high pressure water being pumped through cooling channels, converting it to high pressure steam to drive a steam turbine. Humanity's tried and tested method of creating electricity. The material that fulfills this role needs some unique properties. First, in order to optimize for heating and tritium breeding, we need the material to be a neutron multiplier. When the high energy neutron from the fusion reaction enters the blanket wall, we want it to strike an a massive problem when the uranium is exposed to those high energy neutrons. The same kind of neutrons that split uranium for fission reactors. This creates fissile isotopes or, in other words, it makes the beryllium radioactive. If there were 30 parts per million of uranium to beryllium in a commercial scale fusion reactor, that would mean it contains 17 kilograms of natural uranium and 123 grams of uranium-235 the uranium needed for fission reactors. The byproducts of this uranium would make disposing of the blanket at the end of the generator's life incredibly difficult. This all points to one major problem that I see with tokamak fusion reactors. Even if we manage to reach net energy output, these generators don't solve the biggest problem holding nuclear energy back, cost. Nuclear fission power is a wonder technology of the last century. It promised abundant, clean, cheap energy, a technology that we scarcely even dreamed of two centuries ago as we first discovered the existence of the atom. Yet, we are closing down nuclear fission reactors all across the world when we need that clean energy more than ever, because it's uneconomical. The cost of building a nuclear fission reactor and dealing with the radioactive byproducts when decommissioning it are the two primary factors making it uneconomical. And tokamak reactors are driving straight towards the exact same economic problem. However, one company is doing it differently. Helion. The company I visited to witness nuclear fusion reactors and interview their brilliant CEO, David Kirtley. They are doing things completely differently to everyone else in nuclear fusion research. They aren't capturing energy with steam power eliminating the need for costly beryllium blankets. They are developing a method of making fuel on site that doesn't require lithium, instead using the cheap and plentiful deuterium to create it during fusion. And they are using a completely different magnetic confinement method to achieve nuclear fusion temperatures. Next week, we will be releasing a full-length documentary about Helion right here on YouTube. So 
make sure to click the bell so you can watch it as soon as it's released. In the meantime, you can continue learning about the physics of nuclear fusion with this advanced physics course on Brilliant called Electricity and Magnetism. Electromagnets play a pivotal role in many advanced technologies, nuclear fusion, maglev trains, and even MRI machines. It's powerful knowledge to obtain, and you can complete this course for free by signing up at brilliant.org forward slash real engineering. Getting started on your first course is completely free, but the first 500 people that sign up with our link will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. This is the perfect holiday gift for the lifelong learner in your life. I'm a very visual learner. I struggle to understand things just through reading text. But Brilliant includes interactive elements to help people like me to quickly grasp concepts and test knowledge along the way to ensure you are understanding the concepts you are learning. This not only makes it fun and interesting to learn on Brilliant, but these bite-sized interactive lessons make it easier to jump in and out when you have time. They even have a mobile app allowing you to learn anywhere. So delete all those time-wasting games from your phone and replace them with Brilliant. Brilliant focuses on facilitating effective education that will help you progress in your learning goals, whether it's professional career advancement or just for fun for lifelong learners. Brilliant are adding content monthly, so there's always something new to learn. We even have our own real engineering course that explores the science behind rockets, including orbits and center pedal acceleration. You can get started for free by clicking the link on screen right now. And the first 500 people to do so will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription.